thank you everyone for, for coming here this afternoon. Um, if I could introduce Hannah, um, who is with us today, um, who's a freelance uh, WordPress developer from Bristol and is co-founder of Green Tech Southwest and is on a mission to raise awareness about the environmental impact of digital technology. Um, Chris has already said, um, Hannah's going to um, give us a presentation. Um, we're going to go into, we're going to have some questions and answers in, in the chat. I'm going to break out rooms for say 20 minutes and then come back and discuss what we've learned in the breakout rooms. So over to Hannah. Hey, awesome. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for, for joining um, and for showing interest in this topic. Um, I am just going to do a little technical wizardry here and hopefully <laughs> share my screen um, without too much hassle. So bear with me a second. Um, it should be that one. Okay. Um, see, now the problem is, is when I share my screen, I can't see any of you anymore. So um, I'm just wondering if, if Dan or Chris or Eleanor, if you could tell me if you can see my slides okay. Yeah, all good. Fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. Fantastic. So um, Dan has very kindly invited me along today to talk to you about digital carbon footprints. Um, before I kind of get into the topic, I will just introduce myself, although Dan sort of said most of the things that... Um, I was planning to say, um, so it'll be short. So my name is Hannah Smith. Um, I'm a freelancer in Bristol. Um, I have a number of different skill sets. Um, my main skill set is that I'm a web developer. So I code uh, websites for people in something called WordPress, which I'm, I'm sure many of you will have heard of. Um, so my background is in computer science and I'm a technically minded person. Um, I also have a lot of experience in management, so um, I actually worked at the Environment Agency for seven years here in Bristol, uh, doing a variety of management type roles. Um, and I do a lot of speaking and writing because when you work on your own, it's it, that sort of stuff helps you get out there and meet people. It could be a bit lonely otherwise. Um, and as Dan mentioned, I'm co-founder of something called the Green Tech Southwest Meetup. We actually had a session today at lunchtime today. Um, and I'm also very involved with something called the Climate Action Tech Community as well. Um, so what am I going to cover in this talk today? So I have assumed that, um, oh, sorry, the clicking's not working. What's going on there? There we go. Okay. So I have assumed that uh, given, given the audience that I understand the majority of you are English language teachers, actually my sister's an English language teacher. Um, she works at the one of the international schools in Paris as, a, as an English teacher. Um, so she was very chuffed when I told her I was coming along to do this today. Um, so I have assumed that there is, um, you, you aren't a technical audience. Um, so I'm going to try and keep things um, not, not so basic, but basic enough that I hope everyone will be able to understand the kind of concepts that I'm talking about. So I'm not going to go into too much techno babble, don't worry. Um, although if anyone does have more deep technical questions, you are, of course, welcome to ask them. So what I'm going to cover, uh, I'm going to give us an overview of how digital technology can damage or impact the environment. This is not always clear or obvious. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the stuff we need to think about when tech is actually being manufactured and also when it is being used. Um, and then littered throughout the talk are hopefully approaches that you will find useful to lessen those impacts to lessen that impact. So I'm trying to keep it um, relatable, uh, this talk. Um, okay, so I always think it's really useful that when you define what something is, you also define what it isn't. So what this talk isn't. Um, so just to be absolutely clear, I am not hating on digital technologies or the internet in any way, shape or form throughout this talk. I think digital technology is absolutely a marvel and a wonder. And ever since I was a child, I was fast, I've been fascinated with computers and the internet. Um, although the internet didn't come along until sort of my mid mid teens, but I really, really love technology and the possibility and solutions it can bring. So this talk is not really about saying this stuff is bad. 
the, the thrust of this talk is about a way, raising awareness of the impact and some of the wasteful habits that we have um, that we perhaps don't know about. The other thing that this talk isn't is statistically exact. Uh, because actually that's just really, really, really hard. Um, I do use statistics and numbers throughout the talk and I use the most credible sources that I can find. But my suggestion to you is that the numbers are there to kind of give you a guide, a sense of how big or small a particular impact or problem might be. So you might go on the internet later and read a news article that gives slightly different numbers than what I give. And I will talk a little bit about why estimating this stuff is so, so, so difficult. And the other thing, just to be absolutely clear, this is a half an hour talk. We definitely do not have time for comprehensive masterclass on the whole topic. So my aim today is to kind of uh, educate you about some of the key things um, and then kind of give you more of a food for thought type adventure and the idea being that some of the things I say will resonate with you some some others won't um, and it's kind of up to you to decide how you want to take these things forward and, and what works for you and the situation that you're in both at home and at work as well. So I hope that kind of gives you an overview of what I'm going to get into. Um, let's crack into it. So let's get going. So the, uh, let's start with an overview of digital technology, uh, of how digital technology damages and impacts the environment. And my feeling is very much one of my absolute mantras that knowledge is power. So once you understand something, you can choose to, to do something about it. Um, so this first section is very much about trying to empower you with some knowledge. OK, so. What are, the over, what are the overall carbon emissions from ICT? Now, I suspect that a few of you might be familiar with the term ICT, and maybe some of you won't be. It stands for Information Communications Technology, and it's essentially a another way of saying digital or another way of saying the internet. We have a lot of interchangeable terms these days. Um, so the... ICT, uh, so the digital's total life cycle carbon footprint is approximately 730 million tonnes of CO2 uh, each year. Um, so if you're anything like me, maybe you're not able to put that number into context, not sure what that means. So putting it into a global context, that is equivalent to roughly 1.4% of global carbon emissions. And to further contextualise that number, if we rank, ranked the internet or ICT as a country, it would actually come out as the sixth biggest polluter if it was a country. So that's a significant impact. Um, and you may have seen this particular, this next one in the news quite a bit. It was quite a popular comparison. Um, tech or, or digital is the, the carbon emissions re resulting from it are on a par with the fuels burned by the aviation industry. It's, it's important to note that it's, it's to do with the fuels burnt by the aviation industry. It's not the manufacture and uh, deployment of planes. We're just talking about the fuels. But we see a lot of, about aviation and how bad flying is in the news, and it, especially in relation to climate change. But we don't really see so much about the Internet. Now, it might be that some people argue that flying is a luxury and that only a very small number of people get to enjoy that privilege. Um, and that digital is, is actually being considered as a basic human right by most people, uh, by many people, I should say. So it might be that's the reason why we don't see as much talk about the impact of digital. Um, but um, I'm sorry, I can't remember. One of you said that you've become more aware of this topic lately, and it is definitely starting to hit the mainstream a little bit more, which is absolutely awesome. OK, so we've sort of talked about as a high level overview of the carbon emissions coming from digital. Let's drill down a little bit deeper. Let's actually have a look at the impact of device manufacture. So what I mean by that is the actual carbon emissions and environmental impact from creating digital devices. Digital devices are things like your phone um, or your laptop or a television or a games console or even the servers um, that are running our digital tech. So I'm going to focus in on thinking about user devices, so phones, laptops, desktops, etc. 
And we need to start off by understanding that actually manufacturing these devices in the first place is where the majority of the pollution comes from. Um, so actually between 70 to 95% of the total pollution from digital devices actually arises from the manufacture of these devices. So the very creation of them, that just the fact that they exist at all is responsible for an incredible amount of pollution. And some people might say that actually manufacturing these devices costs the earth. Smartphones are definitely the worst. So smartphones are right at the top end of that range. So they're right at the 95% of total pollution. And one of the reasons for this is because devices use rare raw, I always find this tricky to say, rare raw materials, um, which are very, very hard to find and produce. So we're mining for, um, I believe 16 of the 17 world's uh, precious earth metals are now found in smartphones. And I believe that uh, for every ton of um, rare, uh, uh, of raw uh, a rare raw material that we put into a phone, so for every ton, we actually generate 2,000 tons of waste. Um, and as many of you may be aware, mining is not a particularly nice um, a nice industry or a nice activity at all. So we have this situation where the devices in our pocket um, are literally costing the earth to manufacture. Um, we also have a growing problem with something called e-waste, which stands for electronic waste. And that is basically electronics, such as cables, such as televisions, uh, such as old laptops, old phones, we have this growing problem of e-waste, which is, has reached its end, the end of its life. So these electronics are no longer being able to be reused, they're broken, and they're ending up in landfill. And it was estimated that in 2019, we created 53.6 million metric tons of global e-waste. And that is just an enormous mountain of electronics that we're just discarding. The thing that really, really bothers me about this is that in um, a rich country like the UK, where I'm speaking to you from, I know some of you are in other countries as well, but here in the UK, we do not see the impact of this stuff. It's hidden away from us. Um, a lot of people talk about, oh, how wonderful it is that we are recycling e-waste, but the reality of recycling e-waste is a horrible, horrific image like this. So this is um, an e-waste recycling plant in Ghana. It's in a place called Abagloshi. I think I've said that right. And the reality of recycling e-waste is that it's, it, the, the, the e-waste is actually burnt in open dumps to glean the um, precious metals out of them. Um, and that is terrible for the countries that this is happening in, in this example, Ghana. It's terrible for the people that are having to do it, but we here in the UK, we don't see it. We don't know about it. We ship this problem off to somebody else. So even when e-waste is recycled, it's not always a pretty picture by any stretch of the imagination. So, sorry, it's, it's a bit of a doom and gloom place to start with, but I think it's really important that people are aware of this. So anyway, how can we reduce our impact? So just thinking about these devices that we own. So first thing is ask yourself, do you really, really need to upgrade to the latest device? Or is it just clever marketing making you think you need a faster phone or a faster uh, laptop or whatever? I mean, as a web developer these days, the vast majority of phones being sold are far, far, far more capable than they need to be to do the vast majority of internet surfing or running apps. So we definitely have a kind of consumer problem and a marketing problem. Um, so ask yourself, when that promotion comes through from your mobile company, do you really need to upgrade to the latest device? It's become unfashionable to repair things or upgrade things, um, but there is a really strong movement to start bringing this um, ethos of repairing electronics back into the modern world. And one of the clients that I build websites for is called the Restart Project. And they're awesome, they're a charity. Um, they're based in the UK, but they operate all across Europe. 
um, and they hold something called fixing parties or repair parties actually uh, there's their proper title um, which are in-person events where people can rock up bring their broken electronics and meet with experts who will show them and teach them how to repair or upgrade that device so there's a lot of mobile phones you can give two or three more years to by just replacing the screen, which often gets broken, or, or the back of your phone, you can't actually see it, but the back of mine's damaged, um, or replacing the battery, which are relatively straightforward things to do if you've got a bit of time and patience. And so there are some fantastic movements out there that are helping people to repair or upgrade devices. And if you do really need to buy a new device, and if you do need to buy it, then you know, I'm not saying don't don't get involved in the technical world, because as I said at the start of the talk, I think, you know, tech is brilliant. Um, but there are other ways um, you could buy second hand or even ethically made devices. Um, so online, I buy all my electronics on eBay these days. Um, there is a fantastic um, resource called Ethical Consumer. So if you're interested in buying new things, um, electronics, but also all kinds of other consumer items. The Ethical Consumer website is brilliant. So I highly recommend checking that out. Um, and Fairphone is a really interesting alternative for ethically made phones. Um, so this tweet is from a lady called Kate Rayworth. I don't know if any of you have heard of Kate before. Um, if you're interested in sustainability, you may have come across the concept of donor economics. And Kate is the author of Donut Economics. Um, and I picked out this tweet. I quite liked it. You know, she's advocating for, for using Fairphone. And they have fantastic um, a circular approach to manufacturing devices. They are quite expensive, won't lie. Um, so they're not for everyone, but they are an option to consider. It may work for you. OK, I'm just going to have a quick sip of my drink. So we're about halfway through. So we talked about the manufacturing of devices and I talked to you there about the fact that there's a really big hidden environmental impact that the marketing departments don't really tell us about. Why would they? Because their bottom line is selling and making money. So we've talked about manufacture. Let's talk about actually using those devices now and the environmental impact associated with that. Okay, so it, I had not actually realised this, this new thing, this thing I'm about to point out for, to you for quite a while. Um, it, it's rel relatively new knowledge to me. Um, well, I say relatively new, 18 months to a year. I never really understood why using technology had an environmental impact. I can understand the manufacture of devices, but actually using tech, how does that create an impact? Well, it creates an impact because it requires lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of electricity. So it's estimated that around 3.6% of the global electricity that we produce is actually being used to power devices and the internet. That's quite a lot of power going into the internet. Excuse me. And that actually it's predicted to rise phenomenally to potentially as much as 8% by 2030, which is a really, really significant amount of energy that the, that the digital is using. Now, that wouldn't be such an issue if energy production was impact free, but energy production is not impact free. Producing energy creates, still creates a significant carbon emission. So this is some data from the EIA. And the EIA stands for the International Energy Association and they're, they're based in America. And this data is for 2017. And it shows us that in 2017, 65% of the world's energy was produced using fossil fuels. Um, I'm, I don't really talk much about why fossil fuels are bad in this talk. Um, I'm gonna take a leap of faith and uh, assume that you're aware of that, that of, the, of the really negative impact of fossil fuels. And the short answer is fossil fuels are bad and we need to get off them as soon as we possibly can. So 65% of the world's electricity is still coming from fossil fuels. 
25% from renewables. So that's really, really great. So solar, wind, hydroelectric are all forms of renewable energy and 10% nuclear. Nuclear for me is a funny, a funny one. Um, it has big environmental impact, but it doesn't have a big carbon emissions. So I guess it depends on what your priorities are. But what we do know is that in 2017, 65% of the world's electricity came from fossil fuels. So that's not awesome. So one thing that you can do to lessen the impact of any tech or digital that you're running, uh, both at home or in the office, is, is look to switch your home or office supply to renewables. Uh, these are actually often cheaper tariffs as well. Um, I wanted to fact check that statement. So I found a really interesting article from Money Saving Expert. I've linked to it at the bottom of the slides um, and I'll make the link to the slides available shortly. Um, that, that, you know, did quite a bit of research into this. And, and it is true. I know from my own experience, um, we've switched to a supplier called o Octopus um, from, I think we were on EDF before and it is significantly cheaper. Um, so it's definitely worth looking at. And we are very, 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 very lucky here in the UK. We have a huge number of tariffs to choose from. Um, I think Europe is pretty good for choice. Um, if you're in the US, um, you're not so lucky, I don't think. Um, but here in the UK, we certainly have an abundance of green renewable energy tariffs that we can choose from. So worth having a look at. Um, if you are involved in running digital services, so perhaps you're in the tech department or something like that, um, or maybe even just um, running websites, um, you have to have hosting in order to serve the web content to somebody, uh, to a user. So you can also consider buying hosting that is also powered by renewables. Um, the Green Web Foundation, um, also one of my clients, are an absolutely awesome resource for understanding what hosts and servers are running sustainably. We'll, I'll come back to that in a, in a sec, in a few slides time. But I think it's really important to say that renewable energy is not a panacea, okay? So creating renewable energy still has an environmental impact. We still have to produce solar panels. We still have to produce wind turbines. And as of yet, we haven't figured out how to recycle those or what to do with them once they're uh, once they've reached their end of life. Same issue that we have with e-waste. Um, so it's not a panacea. It's definitely a step in the right direction. And that's what we have to do. We have to transition into the right direction. But it doesn't, moving to renewable energy doesn't just solve everything. But as I say, it is less than fossil fuels. So happy days, that is good. But one of the things that we need to be doing as users and perhaps even content creators and, and producers of digital services is we need to be looking to reduce the overall amount of energy needed by making things efficient. Actually, the talk that we had at um, Green Tech Southwest today was by a chap called Jerry McGovern. And Jerry talks a lot about this concept of data waste. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that shortly too. And this idea of that we as users of digital technologies create a lot of data that we don't need, that we don't use, that doesn't add value but we don't see the impact from that. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that we can do to reduce the overall amount of energy needed by using less data and by making things more efficient. And then of course, once we've done the reduction, then we can seek to use energy that has been created in the lowest impact possible. But the best energy for the planet is the energy that we don't use in the first place. So there's definitely some stuff to think about there. Okay, so I want to talk to you in this next section now about how we quantify the carbon emissions of running and using digital services. This is actually really, really tricky, unfortunately. And the reason why this is so tricky is because there are lots and lots of different variables at play. So one of the variables at play is the data center. And so the data center or server or hosting, they're all called different things, but they all serve the same purpose. Um, one of the things that your data center does is it holds the data and makes it available for somebody to request to view. So the data center prepares your data. Data centers can be running on renewable energy or not renewable energy. And they can also be run 
to different levels of efficiency. So there's something called a PUE, which is the power usage efficient, ugh, power usage efficiency metric. Um, and the lower that number is, the more efficient the data center is. And they're all run differently and in different ways. So you have a lot of variables there. You also have a lot of variables as to how the data actually travels to you. So when a data center receives a request for information, it sends it across the network to you. And that data has to physically travel from the data center to your device. And how that data travels to you um, can, can be done in more efficient or less efficient ways. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a tick. Um, but it has to physically travel from A to B. Um, and also, if your data center is, say, in New York, and you're here in Bristol accessing that information, it has to travel that full distance from New York to London um, over wires, transmitted wirelessly, et cetera. Um, and then the device itself. So different devices draw different or, or burn different amounts of electricity to do the same thing. So for example, a television or a big screen will use significantly more energy than your phone. So there are huge amounts of variables here and it is all a bit complicated. And I have a degree in computer science and I still find it incredibly difficult to figure out how to measure this stuff. But thankfully, uh, there are some wonderful developers out there who are, have, who are creating some really useful tools to help us. Uh, this is one of the first ones I'd like to introduce to you. Maybe you've come across it already. It's quite good fun. It's called the Website Carbon Calculator. And its homepage looks like this slide. Um, and in the bar, you can type in any web address and you can hit calculate. And then what it will do is give you an assessment of how good your website is. It's benchmarked against other websites that have been run through this service. So it gives you an idea of how much CO2 is produced every, on every visit to that page that you put in, um, whether it's running on renewable energy or not. And then if you scroll down the page, there's some suggestions of, of how you can reduce that impact. So I'm hoping that some of you might be there running some of your sites through this tool as we're talking. And if you are doing that, I'd love to see, see your results shared in the chat. Um, if you want something a little bit more technical, um, EcoGrader is a, a similar tool, um, but it gives you a little bit more in-depth information. Um, so EcoGrader is also a really, really useful tool. And in fact, the website Carbon Calculator and EcoGrader both use the data from the Green Web Foundation that I introduced to you before. Um, and they use that data to assess whether your, your hosting is green or not. And then getting a lot more technical, there are loads of performance tools that you can use. This is Google PageSpeed, Insights, and again, you can analyze a site. This is meant to look at performance as a bigger thing, um, rather than just looking at the environmental impact. Um, but I use this kind of Google PageSpeed Insights to help me um, fine tune the things that I'm working on. So there's a few tools that you can have a look at. If you know of any others, please, please put them in the, in the comments. I, I, I'm keen to learn too. Um, but those are some of the key ones that, that, that seem really popular. Okay, so I'm gonna trot through. Now we've kind of learned a bit about the topic um, and we can understand a little bit about the environmental impact. I'm gonna trot through some different approaches that you might find useful. So one of the first ones is, I don't know if any of you have heard of Ecosia. Ecosia is a search engine that you can use and it's a registered B Corp. Um, so a B Corp is a, is a type of accreditation an organization can get that shows that they're ethical essentially. And what Ecosia does is every time you run a search, the ad revenue that it generates from your search, they use that to plant trees. Um, and they have planted 115 million trees across the world just through people using a different search browser. So instead of that money going to Google, that money is going to Ecosia. Um, now, for those of you that are perhaps involved in running schools, um, I know a lot of your intranets um, might have a default search engine. 
well worth considering whether your tech department could use Ecosia as the default search engine um, instead of you know, something like Google. So something to think about. On a more personal level, what I mentioned at the beginning is we need to be looking at data waste. We need to look for ways to transfer less data because if we're transferring less data, then we're using less electricity. And if we're using less electricity, then that's a good thing. So what we wanna be doing is seeking out and eliminating any data that is being created or transferred, but that doesn't actually add value. Now, I love this tweet from a lady called Becky Use, um, and she likens data being like glitter. So it lures humans in with its shininess. So people love to have data about things. It, it is useful for driving decision-making, uh, decision-based, sorry, evidence-based decision-making. It's really useful for that, um, but it's not always necessary. Um, so she says it lures humans in with its shininess. It's very easy to accumulate. <laughs> it's found in places that you least like, uh, that you <laughs> found in places you least likely expect to find it. It's almost impossible to get rid of. And, and everyone insists on using it without thinking through the consequences. So let's talk about some really specific ways then about how you can actually cut data waste. So I'm gonna go through this stuff quite quickly. Um, as I said, the idea is just to kind of inspire you with some things you can look at. So you want to only be creating and storing data that you actually need. Businesses apparently typically only analyze 10% of the data that they collect. Um, so this is data that you might collect through contact forms, it might be analytics data. Um, the rest is what's known as dark data. If you want to read more about that, there's a link at the bottom to a company called Lucidworks that have, have written a whole load of information about this, really interesting. So things that you can consider are analytics, backups of things that you have, maybe old versions of things that you have. See how you can get rid of it. Another thing that you can do is to save locally instead of to a cloud. So at Jerry's talk today, I think Jerry actually said that saving to the cloud uses 3000 times more energy than saving something locally. Now, I appreciate that saving to the cloud, uh, sorry, saving locally isn't the right choice for many people and for many of the situations they have. The thing is, is that when you save something to the cloud, it is protected. And, and the data is, is, is held safe for you. But you can save data locally. So if you have a whole bunch of old photos, for example, rather than saving them on the cloud, could you get hold of a secondhand hard drive and save them there instead? Lots of things to think about. Um, and you could also consider using a CDN, a content delivery network, if you have a large international audience or accessing online documents. So that relates to the thing I was saying to you about how data travels across the world. If you actually have a data center that's situated closer to the people accessing your data, the data has less distance to travel, therefore uses less electricity. Okay, I'm gonna just go for a couple more minutes and then we'll be done. So as a content creator, it's a few things that you could consider doing. Um, if you create PDFs, you can actually compress them and make a huge saving on file size. So smaller file sizes are better for the environment. So I've provided a link here to an online PDF compressor that you can use. Avoid video if it's not really necessary. We'll talk more about that in a tick. And use well-optimized images. So if you're creating web content for web pages, think about the size of the image, whether the image is in the right format. So you wanna be using JPEGs for photos, not PNGs and whether those images are compressed to remove the unneeded data. Um, so this is a nice little example. Um, JPEGs can be optimized and you can reduce the quality of JPEGs quite significantly. And so the bigger, the, the larger the number of pixels that you have in a JPEG image, the more file size um, it, it, it uses. So I'll give an example here of a picture I took of my dog on my digital camera, and it was 2.9 megabytes when I took it off my camera. When I resized it to 1400 pixels, which was actually the size that I wanted to use it, the file size dropped to 716 kilobytes. That's a really significant reduction. Um, if you then compress the quality of the image, so you reduce the quality of the image, 
what that means is that your human eye can't actually detect a difference in the image. Certainly it can't to about 50% quality, um, but the file size is loads smaller. So there's definitely something to explore and think about when you're putting images online. How can you cut uh, data waste at home? Um, so some examples of things you can do is change settings on social media to prevent video autoplay. Not only is video autoplay really annoying, I find it is, but it uses energy. So pretty much every social media platform now, including Netflix, has a setting where you can turn off video autoplay. Something else to think about, subscribe from unwanted mailing lists. So rather than just deleting them, actually unsubscribe. So those emails are not being sent to you in the first place and they're not using energy to arrive to you. This is an interesting one. If you stream content digitally, you could consider perhaps downloading your favorite albums or series. So actually there's a number of music albums that I tend to listen to, not on repeat, but I listen to often. So rather than streaming them afresh every time I wanna to listen to them, I've now downloaded them on Spotify so that when I listen, listen to the album or a track from that album, it's not being downloaded and using energy. It's being played from my machine. Another little tip is bookmarking commonly used websites instead of Googling them. Googling uses energy. It's not that much energy, but it is still energy. So you can bookmark commonly used sites instead of just typing them in. Okay, right. This is my our last two slides and then I'll wrap up. Um, I think we just need to talk a little bit about video calls because um, I should imagine for many of you, this is actually really relevant. Um, so did you know that an hour's audio call, which is done on something like Zoom or Google Hangouts, transfers about 36 megabytes of data per person? When you turn the video on to standard definition video, <clears throat> that's about seven and a half times more data being sent. High definition is about 15 times more. Ultra high definition is 37 times more than audio. So turn off your video when it's not needed. I noticed that most of you had done that when you joined today's call anyway, which was absolutely brilliant. Sure, use the video at the beginning to introduce one another, to, to get to know who's on the call, but then you can switch to audio and save a whole ton of energy. And the last thing that I think you might find interesting, given that the, the roles that you do, is thinking about choosing the least energy intensive data transfer method. So actually using a wired connection, so like a wire that you physically plug into your device, uses a lot less energy than Wi-Fi. Um, um, using, uh, transferring data over 3G, so that's like a mobile network, uh, uses 15 times more energy than Wi-Fi. So if you're out and about on the move and you go to a cafe, you could consider asking for the Wi-Fi password rather than just using the data on your off your mobile phone plan. Um, and then there's a similar uh, kind of relationship between 3G and 4G and 5G is just, oh my God, like, let's not even go there with how much energy 5G uses. Okay, so there's a couple of books you might be interested in. I mentioned Jerry McGovern um, and World Wide Waste. You can get a, both a paper copy and a digital copy of his book. And there's also another book it's a bit more technical, so if you're a content creator, you might find this useful. Um, it's called Designing for Sustainability by Tim Frick. So two highly recommended books. So just to sum up what I've said in a nutshell, tech is a significant cause of environmental impact. Um, and it's kind of really unforgivable when it's wasteful, when we are just using tech almost for the sake of it and that it's not really adding value. And we can make an enormous difference today already by using devices that are already out there. So buying secondhand, making what we have last longer, fixing and repairing. Purchasing renewable energy is something we can do to make a big difference. And as I talk quite a bit about there as well, is culling data we won't make use of. And asking questions and educating ourselves about this topic is something we can do to make an enormous difference too. And it goes, it's useful just to say this as a side point. There are loads and loads of co-benefits of being greener, both, you know, in, in other aspects such as eating less meat or perhaps flying less, 
Um, it's the same with our digital services as well. So by reducing the environmental impact of digital services, we will nearly always find a direct correlation to reducing the overall cost of running them. We will see that their speed and performance improves. Things are generally easier to find and accessibility is often improved as well. So there's a whole bunch of other resources. Again, I'll make the slides available for you. And in fact, what time is it? Um, if any of you are on Twitter, um, you can look me up, Hanok can, and I think these slides should now have been published on Twitter. Um, so there'll be a link in there and, and you can have a look at those right now, if there's stuff in there that you want to follow up on. Cool, so I'm sorry, I have overrun a little bit. I did warn <laughs> Dan and Chris, I might do. Uh, so apologies for that. But No, um, no, thank you very much. Have time for questions, um, Vic. Wow, loads for us to think about. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Hannah. Pleasure. Um, what we're going to do now is um, give people the opportunity to, well, if you'd like to ask questions, please put them in the chat, first of all, and we'll give people a few minutes to do that. And then um, we'll go and I, I think discuss it in breakout rooms. So I'm getting lots of very useful comments coming through. It's kind of scary, this topic, once you start thinking about it, you just, or your brain just kind of fires off in all these different directions. You start kind of going, oh, but there is this, this, and this, and this. So yeah, I'm glad that you've all found it useful. <laughs> and any immediate questions? Immediate questions in the chat. Otherwise, I think um, we're going to go into breakout rooms. Ah, uh, your Twitter handle. Can you repeat that? I'll pop it in the comments for you now um, so you can find it. And actually, I can put the link to the slides in here as well, because I, I appreciate many of you might not be on Twitter as well. So I'll do that. We've got one question about um, how safe is it to recycle devices that is in um, other people reusing, I think, is is what that was uh, was asking. Oh, that's a really, really interesting question. Um, I suppose when you say safe, um, Joanna, I guess you're thinking about sort of personal data implications and whether people can access your uh, logins, things like that. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's. It's perfectly safe if you wipe the whole device before um, before you use it. So I typically will buy laptops and phones and things from an established refurbing company. Um, so there's a couple of different ones that I use and I tend to buy devices from them online and I know that they will clean everything for me and, and kind of do a what's called an operating system reset, basically. So it wipes everything and gives you a completely clean slate. As a general user, that's completely safe and absolutely fine. And it will be the same as the factory settings that you get when you, you buy a new device. So I don't think that there's a concern there. And for things like cables or televisions, things like that, uh, sorry, not televisions, uh, cables, maybe cameras, microphones, things like that, those aren't saving any data anyway. So that would be quite safe to use. So my advice to you is, find a company that you trust and buy a refurbed device. Um, so if you use like Apple devices, you can buy refurbed machines from Apple, for example. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. So yes, it's safe, um, but just make sure the device has been factory reset or has had the operating system uh, completely uh, reset. It's a great question. We, we've got another question here about um, switching video off when a lot of schools have moved online and and uh, um, uh, for safeguarding reasons asking people to keep videos on i think that might be um something that we we carry on discussing in the in the breakout rooms it's a really great one um i i do really feel very very strongly that when tech is serving a purpose such as safeguarding then it is the right thing to use because it's, it's, it's fulfilling a need. Um, but when we have cameras on and it's not fulfilling a need, um, then I might argue that you know, we have a problem and we should definitely be seeking to do things differently. 
Um, but yes, um, yeah, as, as Dan says, I think I'd love to hear your thoughts from the breakout rooms about that, what you think. Uh, yes, sorry, not just safeguarding, but difficult to teach a language without seeing someone's face is, is, is another aspect of it, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I teach coding online. Um, so I hear you. It is really tough when you can't see people's faces. And, and that's what I mean. I think if it adds value and it means that you can do your job in a better, more meaningful way, then I personally, my opinion is it's justified. Um, but there are, you know, as I say, cases where it's not justified. OK, I think at that point we're going to go into breakout rooms and discuss it. So what I'd like people to do is... Um, introduce yourself and um, and say why you're here um, and then what answer these questions so um, what if anything has surprised you from Hannah's presentation um, what do you think you might change personally and in your school and if you could nominate somebody to summarize your discussion when we come out of the breakout rooms great Great, everyone's back. So, um, would somebody from a breakout room like to sort of unmute and and sort of give us a brief summary of what they've discussed? Um, shall I go first, Dan? We we forgot, of course, being teachers, we forgot to nominate anyone to <laughs> <laughs> record what was being said. So I, I agreed to um, just uh, talk a little bit and then perhaps um, others in the breakout room can chip in if I've forgotten anything. Um, so in, in terms of um, surprises, people were surprised, um, had never really thought about the impact of downloading, um, uh, you know, that visiting a website, for example, has, has an impact. Um, and others had not really thought about the the impact of you know videos whether videos should be on or off. Um, and another big surprise was the the idea that saving to the cloud has a big impact. Um, and and we talked about how that sometimes happens automatically. So for example, if if I'm um, transferring photos from my camera to a laptop, then almost automatically it, it, you know, it's sent to Dropbox or Google Drive or whatever. We know we can switch these things off, but um, and, you know, we hadn't really considered the, the impact of particularly sort of large files um, like photos that get duplicated across different sites as well. So that's something to look out for. Um, and then um, some of us talked about emails and clearing out emails. And we also talked about um, how schools, well, we, actually, we were saying that it would be good to have a checklist of the most impactful things that schools can do. So we thought that perhaps um, uh, running on green energy, for example, is a pretty big impact that a school can have on the, th on the, on the problem. Um, and perhaps running um, on green servers as well, which is something that all schools could do, which might have a major impact. But we were kind of thinking it would be nice to have a checklist of, you know, really the most impactful things that we can do right down to sort of minor things like, I don't know, um, if it is a minor thing, I don't know, um, stripping out all of the copied stuff in emails that we send, for example. So that's everything I wrote down here. I don't know if anybody wants to add anything from our group on that. That's a good list. I think we're, we're going to be um, putting some of these this list up on the um, ELT Footprint UK website, aren't we? So it's um, it, it will be something that people can access later as well. I don't know if you noticed, but Joanna's just saying in the comments there that they can't unmute, other participants can't unmute themselves. I don't know if you noticed. <laughs> My bad. How's that? Is that working okay. now? Yeah, we can okay. now. Okay. I didn't particularly want to say anything. I just, <laughs> <laughs> that's why you've got a big silence. Um, I, I was just thinking there when you were speaking, Chris, about um, you can normally set the size of the photos that you're taking on your camera because uh, you know as, as camera technology progresses the size of the photos gets bigger and bigger and bigger 
and um, you can normally set the, the, the size of the photo that you're taking and potentially set the, the size that's being uploaded to the cloud as well. So that's another way to control um, the, the amount of data. Yeah, it's just something I never really considered before, but you're, you're mm. absolutely right. Um, most people have got their videos switched off and um, I, I would I would like to, I, I guess that's um, because of what we're talking about really, but I, I would invite people if they want to turn on their videos at, at this stage, um, particularly if they want to talk. So uh, Noni, I guess. Yeah, it just reminded me of this, what Dan was saying about this uh, sizing your photographs. Um, how many of us have got or stored on our laptops uh, our photos stored in two or three different places or copies of them and so on. And I know that there are programs which you can run through your computer, which will tell you when you've got uh, files repeated on your computer. Uh, so that may well be something. I don't know uh, the names of those programs, but I'm thinking of that as being a, a way of uh, doing some serious cleanups on what we store on our computers. And I'm the first one who's guilty. That's a great idea. Does anybody know the name of one? Because I could do with that. Was that the name of a, a program to uh, resize images? No, to find De duplicate. deduplicate um, files. Ooh. Um, Ooh. Yeah, there are some about. I don't know one either off the top of my head. Wow. Yeah, there's homework for all of us. Yes, an Ecosia <laughs> search, not a Google search, an Ecosia okay. one. <laughs> Anyone else like to, to talk about what they were discussing in the breakout rooms? We were in um, breakout room one um, with uh, Alison, Jane for a while, Christopher was there, um, and yourself, and Nonny, and then there was another lady, but she didn't have her video on, she's got the mic on, so I'm not sure who that was. Um, I'll put my video on and um, we, we basically s repeated what Chris said in his um, video was quite important in teaching and um, it still needs to continue uh, regarding teaching, um, especially for such shy students, you know, sometimes they're better off on Zoom than they are in the classroom. Um, Chris mentioned that you could have a mixture of synchronous and then asynchronous file uh, teaching so that you've got the students in front of the video for some of the time and then turn the video off and they go away and they do a task and then they come back, um, which is one way of saving it. Um, Niall has said that they're going to take the, the uh, results of this meeting to the staff um, through a meeting next week and going to talk about it and see what else they can do. Uh, Noni was saying from Spain um, that they're going, she's going to take back to her language schools. She's vice chair of, I think she said 500 language schools in, in Spain, which is brilliant. And she also said that she's going to compile a, a checklist for schools to go through um, to find out what, what um, they can do to, to help themselves. Um, Jane um, and I mentioned about not having our own schools and we have to depend on host schools to be green um, and it's not always that easy to do. Um, surprise people were, we didn't really mention surprises, we talked more about videos and how it's important um, for teaching. Thank you. Great, thank you. Anyone else like to like to say anything? I don't know about you. I found it a very interesting discussion. Lots to go away and, and think about and change. Um, lots of thank yous. Thank you very much, Hannah, um, for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, thank you to Eleanor and English UK for hosting the Zoom, um, to Helen Kine for um, putting out announcements on social media. Um, uh, thank you, Chris, for, for organising things as well. And um, this is going to this is the first in a series of events. So if you're not already following us on um, on Twitter or linked to the LinkedIn page, then please do that so you get notified of the next events. 
Chris, anything else? Uh, no, I just want to add my thanks and, and thanks to everybody for coming along as well. I, I, I kind of feel that we're, um, I mean, despite Hannah's uh, talk, we're still, you know, coming at this anew. And I, I sort of feel that we're scratching the surface of it. So I, I think there's a lot more to, um, to explore. Uh, and um, yeah, like you, Dan, I would say keep an eye on the ELT Footprint UK uh, website um, because we'll be, you know, putting up ideas from this meeting and, and other kind of stuff that we can glean um, on this issue. And um, of course, also, if you, um, if you enjoy using Facebook, um, have a look at the, um, the International ELT Footprint Community Facebook website as well. Um, there are over 3,000 people using that, um, all adding to <laughs> their digital carbon footprint in the process, I guess. And, and, and maybe there's a thought there in terms of um, thinking about pictures and videos and advice we can give to people. But in any case, do, do go along and have a look at that website because it's uh, full of people who are all committed to the same kind of thing that you know, we're doing today. Yeah, yeah, thanks. For that. It's very confusing because there's there's two Chris's and two ELT footprints. It's really puzzling. I, but yeah, th thanks for that. And we, I mean, our focus is more international than than the UK. But there's they're the same themes and the same challenges. So please, please uh, do have a look at what we're up to as well, and and some of the resources that we produce too. And they, th there's lots of interchangeability, I think, between the two the two organisations. Organisations is probably the wrong word, but I use it anyway. Great. Thank you again, everyone, um, and um, look forward to seeing you on the next event.